Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it has been a while. Anyway, so a little over two years ago, uh, Jay Tolan put out a 51 minute long video where he made a, a bunch of observations with his theodolite. Uh, I've already responded to the first half of the video uh, where I show that all his measurements matched pretty much exactly uh, to what we'd expect on a globe. Uh, I'll leave a link to that response video in the description. Uh, in the second half of his video, uh, JT gets up on the Californian aqueduct, uh, makes a whole bunch of measurements, uh, and at the end, I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that he declares victory for the flat earth. So let's have a look at the three types of measurements he took. Uh, the first one is with his theodolite up on a hill, uh, pointing it at various markers that he could identify later on Google Earth. Uh, and you'll see he's pointing it at the edge uh, of the concrete walls of the aqueduct, uh, which is a few feet above the water level. Uh, the second set of measurements uh, is again with a theodolite, but this time he's trying to measure the level of the water itself. Uh, and he runs into difficulty here because there's a, a few inches of wet concrete above the water, uh, which makes it difficult to measure with a lot of accuracy. And the third set of measurements is him walking downstream with a tape measure uh, and making measurements of the distance between that edge of the concrete wall uh, and the water level. But before we analyze his measurements to see if they have curvature in them, uh, there are two key questions that we need answers to. Number one, what is the elevation profile of the concrete structure of the aqueduct? Uh, does it go up or down in relation to sea level uh, or is it constant? Uh, number two, what is the elevation profile of the water itself? So does it change in elevation relative to mean sea level, uh, perhaps because the water's flowing quickly? Uh, or is it basically a lake uh, where the, the surface is at a constant elevation? So once we've answered these questions, then we can work out whether the measurements support a flat earth or a globe. Okay, so let's look at the concrete walls first. Uh, so from his own video, uh, JT acknowledges that the aqueduct was built to maintain the average downstream slope of three inches per mile. Now that's slightly ambiguous about whether it refers to the concrete structure itself uh, or the so-called slope of the water. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, JT also notes in his video that there are survey benchmarks embedded into the concrete walls. Uh, and these happen to be at the same level uh, as his theodolite measurements. And he actually shows a close up of this one uh, and gets all spooked out because it has the number 33 in it. Uh, but the full number is actually 338.1b. Uh, which signifies that the benchmark is 338.1 miles uh, from the start of the aqueduct, uh, which is way up near San Francisco. Uh, so JT just happens to be on a stretch of 10 miles uh, where all the benchmarks are going to start with 330. So, you know, hashtag Illuminati confirmed. Uh, anyway, uh, we can log on to the, the National Geodetic Survey website uh, and find the exact benchmark he's looking at and we see it's 899.60 meters above sea level. Uh, in fact, we can pretty easily get the elevations of all the survey benchmarks uh, along this stretch of the aqueduct. And if we plot them out in Excel uh, and then draw a, a line of best fit through them, you can get an average elevation change uh, of the concrete structure itself. Uh, and you can see on the graph, uh, that the elevation is changing by 0 0.0955 meters per mile uh, or converted to freedom units, that's uh, 3.76 inches per mile. And that's approximately consistent uh, with the three inches per mile reported by Jay Tolan. All right, that's the first key question answered. So according to the survey benchmarks uh, and the supporting documentation that JT cited, uh, the elevation of the concrete structure slopes downward by three to four inches per mile. Which means now we can analyze the actual measurements he took. Uh, but before I hit play on this little clip, uh, I should try to explain what's going on uh, in the graph in the top left. So for each marker, uh, he's measured a vertical angle to it. 
Uh, and then on Google Earth, he's measured the distance over the ground to each marker. Uh, then he's done some, some simple trigonometry to work out how many feet each marker is below his elevation. So remember, he's up on a hill doing this. Uh, so that first row, marker zero, uh, he's 90.92 feet above it. Uh, in the next column, the relative height in feet, he's, he's effectively zeroed out that elevation. So that's his starting point for the elevation of the concrete walls. The column on the far right, however, uh, is the theoretical drop of eight inches per mile squared. So for example, marker number eight uh, is 8,559 feet away, uh, which is 1.62 miles. Uh, square it, times it by eight inches, uh, and you get 1.752 feet. Easy peasy. All right, what you can see is though that even according to his own measurements, marker number eight is 2.11 feet below the marker number zero. Uh, but is that due to earth curve, uh, due to the slope of the aqueduct, or is it both? Uh, well, we'll get the answer in a second uh, when he adds in that three inches per mile slope uh, in this aqueduct slope cell. Uh, and then you'll see that his measurements match up with the earth curve. Here we go. Let's go to the aqueduct slope. Put in 0.25 feet per mile. That's three inches per mile. Boom! Look at that. Oh my God, just perfect. I was quite agitated. I said, man, I should have never bought that theodolite. So there you go. Uh, his own measurements are, are a near perfect match for there being uh, three inches per mile slope built into the aqueduct, as well as eight inches per mile squared drop due to earth curvature. And I, I have to give Jay Tolan a few points here for actually acknowledging this. So the second key question is, what is the elevation profile of the water? Uh, well, I'm sure that Globers and Flurfs will agree that water seeks its own level, uh, but this is a tricky situation because we actually have flowing water. If that water is flowing really fast, then there might be a significant ele uh, elevation change between the upstream and the downstream. Uh, that's illustrated in the top diagram, which I will call river. Uh, in the bottom diagram, we've got a situation where the water isn't flowing much, uh, if at all, uh, and the surface is all at the same elevation. And I've called this one lake. Uh, but the million dollar question is, which one applies to the aqueduct? Uh, we actually get our answer from a, a very helpful uh, Department of Water Resources employee that Jay Tolan basically interviews <laughs> right near the end of the video, uh, something around the, the 45 minute mark. So to explain what's going on for this sheet, uh, at the top of the screen on the first column is a list of checkpoints. Uh, basically, these are gates where the employee measures the water level on both sides of the gate and then presumably makes a decision to change how much water is flowing. Uh, so at checkpoint 57, uh, this employee measured the height of the water on the upstream side uh, and it was 39.80 feet, uh, which is obviously shorthand for 2,939.80 feet. Uh, if you look at the, the normal water surface elevation column to the left of it. Uh, and on the downstream side, uh, he measured 39.00 feet or 2,939 feet. Uh, same process for checkpoint 56. He measured 40.5 feet on the upstream and 39.8 feet on the downstream. Uh, and again, same process for Checkpoint 55. Uh, now, if you draw these out, like I've done at the bottom here, uh, we have two sections of water where we know the elevation at each end, right? So between gates 55 and 56, we have a two mile stretch and the elevation at the downstream end, which is 40.50 feet, was actually about an inch higher than the upstream end at 40.40 feet. So there's certainly not a three inches per mile slope to the water in this section. Uh, between gates 56 and 57, the elevation is, is 39.80 feet at both ends. Uh, so again, over a two mile section, there is no slope to the water. 
Uh, now, I should mention here for completeness that uh, Jay Tolan's measurements were made between uh, checkpoints 49 and 50, uh, which the employee hasn't measured yet. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the data that we do have, uh, we can say that the water is not sloping downwards in elevation. So that's the second key question answered. The elevation of the water is constant. These are lakes, not rivers. Now, before we look at JT's measurements of the water level, uh, I need to explain first what he means by observer distance and what he means by aqueduct distance. So in this image, uh, JT is up on the hill on the left, which I've named AQ2, and he's pointing his theodolite to water marker six, uh, which is the green line of sight. And according to his measurements, it's uh, 3,252 feet away. But the aqueduct's distance is the distance along this curved path, starting at water marker zero. Uh, and according to JT, this, this wiggly path distance from marker zero to marker six uh, is 4,343 feet, which is about 0 0.82 miles. Now, the reason I bring this up is because JT is under the impression that the Earth is flat and that what he's measuring is the three inches per mile drop of the water. However, if the water does not change elevation and we live on a globe, then all he'd be measuring is the drop due to curvature. And at this distance, the drop due to curvature is 2.66 miles. So the difference in these two calculations, 2.47 inches and 2.66 inches, is about a fifth of an inch and there's no way that he's gonna be that accurate over about 3,000 feet. So he thinks he's measuring the slope of the water uh, when he's actually measuring the drop due to curvature. The other thing to take note of uh, before I play this clip is the image in the top right. He had great difficulty uh, distinguishing between the actual water level uh, and the, the few inches of wet cement or wet concrete above the water. Uh, and the image he's showing here is the, the shot to marker number zero, uh, which is the closest. It's, it's less than 600 feet away. Uh, so you can imagine how hard it would be getting an accurate shot if he's, if he's shooting over a mile. Uh, so anyway, let's listen to JT tell us uh, how he's measured the water dropping away from horizontal because he thinks it's a river, uh, when the data that we have tells us that we're looking at a lake. The water level was dropping along a slant dictated by three inches per mile. So in about two miles, it's about six inches. I plotted this data based on the aqueduct distance along the aqueduct, not direct line of sight. Just incredible, folks. So there you go. Uh, not only did he measure the drop of the concrete structure in the first half, but he also measured the drop of the water. Well done, JT. All right, so far we've shown that his measurements of the aqueduct walls show curvature of the earth and the three inches per mile slope. Uh, we've also shown that he's measured a drop from horizontal in the level of the water, uh, even though it's all at the same elevation. Uh, but what about his measurements with a tape measure from the edge of the walls down to the water level? Well, if you've been paying attention, this should be fairly straightforward. The, the two key questions we had to answer were about the elevation profile of the concrete walls and the elevation profile of the water. And if you put those answers together, it should be fairly easy to conclude that as you walk downstream, the distance between the concrete edge and the water level should get shorter. Uh, but let's go and verify his measurements anyway. Now, the cool thing about the aqueduct uh, is not just that the survey benchmarks have an aqueduct distance associated with them, uh, like the 338.1 benchmark that JT saw, uh, but there's also a, a big ass number painted on the side of the wall uh, every mile. So with those, you can quite easily and quite accurately determine where uh, J. Tolan stuck his tape measure in the water. Uh, and of course, that's what I did. Uh, so upstream, he measured 7 feet 2 inches down to the water at 337.83 miles 
and downstream he measured 6 feet 0 inches at 339.67 miles. So that's a 14 inch change over 1.84 miles. But we need to make a correction uh, because what JT was measuring was actually a slant. So I've done my best here to line up that yellow arrow uh, with a still shot from the video. Uh, and that arrow is obviously meant to represent JT's measuring tape. And I had to rotate it 25 degrees to get the best match. Uh, and 25 degrees seems to match the, the only document I could find that talks about the side slopes of the aqueduct uh, as being between two to one, which is 26 degrees, and three to one, which is 18 degrees. All right, then all we need to do to take the slant into account is some simple trigonometry and we end up with a rate of 3.5 inches per mile. Uh, again, that's consistent with the 3 inches per mile given in the documentation and the 3.75 inches per mile implied by the survey benchmarks. So, just to recap, JT acknowledges that he measured the drop due to earth curvature in the concrete walls. He also measured the drop from horizontal for a body of water that is at rest. And finally, he confirmed that the aqueduct slopes down towards the water level at three to four inches per mile. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why he is king of the curve.